Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Brent Orell, and I am a resident fellow here at AEI where I um, divide my attention between uh, workforce development and this morning's topic, um, criminal justice reform, and in particular, reentry. Um, it's delighted to have all of you here this morning, and uh, also want to greet the people who, it always turns out to be more than I think, are watching online. So um, thank you to those folks, too, who have joined us uh, and are, are watching. Um, so when I came on uh, board here at AEI about two years ago, I was tasked with leading our work on reentry programming uh, for returning citizens. And my interest in this issue goes back uh, almost 20 years um, to my work uh, in leading the Center for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives at the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, uh, uh, in the in the uh, the in the Bush administration, so uh, I was hired for that job right at the end of August of 2001. Uh, a couple weeks later, we were hit by 9/11, and uh, the world was re really turned upside down. Um, and I think uh, uh, for me, uh, it actually created an opportunity to start thinking. To, to pause and to think about some of the issues, um, what the issues might be that I was going to be most interested in, um, in pursuing in that job. So I spent a fair amount of time um, just going out and meeting with um, community leaders, pastors, uh, leaders of nonprofit organizations, chiefly in urban areas around the country. And um, what I heard over and over from them was this new term that I was not familiar with at that point, which was reentry. And uh, over and over, I heard from these community leaders that uh, they were working really hard at trying to hold their communities together, and that the influx of people coming home from prison were undoing their work faster than they could do it, and that they were desperate for help. Um, <clears throat> and they also identified employment as being one of the main needs of people returning from prison. So I was at the Labor Department. Um, employment was and is the business of the Labor Department. And <clears throat> um, so I started to try to talk to these community leaders about what we currently offered in terms of uh, reentry programs through the US Department of Labor, which were at that point the federal bonding program and the Work Opportunity Tax Credit. Uh, and those programs um, were not well regarded uh, by the organizations that I was talking to. In fact, when it came, especially when it came to the federal bonding program, they said, what you're asking us to do in relationship to employers is go to them and say, I've got this person who needs a job, and guess what? They need special insurance in order to work for you because they might commit a crime against another employee or against a customer. And they just said that that's, that's not a sales point. That's a scarlet letter. Um, we need something different. So we set up a project called Ready for Work, um, which was a 30-site uh, or 18-site demonstration um, split between juveniles and adults. And it was focused on employment, case management, mentoring, um, and, uh, and it was implemented through community-based organizations, including some faith-based organizations. Uh, and we let that thing run. Uh, and we collected a lot of data on it. And um, like many reentry programs, it looked pretty good at the beginning. Um, just these, this is not evaluation data, it was just program data, but hey, you know, our people are doing, are doing pretty well not taking into account selection bias or any of that. Um, and, uh, but what we saw over time was that it, as time went on, it was harder and harder to tell the difference between uh, the people who took part in Ready for Work and the people who didn't. We, they looked more and more like the rest of the population as time went on. Uh, I was then in private consulting um, for 10 years and did a little bit of work around reentry and uh, came here to AEI, and one of my first conversations was with David Mulhausen, who's here um, with us today, and he said, you know, these employment programs, they really don't work. 
And I was like, I beg your pardon. You know, I, I, this is, you're, you've hit, and hit very close to home here. Um, and so what I decided to do was to uh, try to assemble a team of researchers and evaluators um, who could come together with us here at AEI to really talk through what the evidence tells us about various aspects um, of uh, reentry programming. Um, and the, the impetus behind this was, that I, I, you know, I'm increasingly concerned that the failure of these programs to make a significant dent in reentry um, is, uh, it's possible that the, um, that we're going to end up undermining public support for criminal justice reform generally, and certainly for reentry programs. So we wanted to get researchers together to really give us some advice on what, what we think might, uh, might work uh, to improve existing programs or to develop new approaches. So that the slide that you see up there right now is a list of all the people who participated uh, in, the, in the working group. Uh, and uh, it is a real, um, you know, uh, who's who of people who are interested in uh, reentry policy and programs, research and evaluation. We spent hours, two, day, two full days, very full days, um, discussing the challenges and opportunities associated with reentry, distilling lessons from the past, and hearing from several of the country's most knowledgeable researchers and program evaluators. A subset of that group we commissioned to um, develop uh, papers based on their insights and distilling down uh, many years of their thinking and experience on reentry. I'd like to thank every one of those authors um, uh, for their tireless work and commitment uh, to promoting the future, a future of hope and opportunity for returning citizens. And I'd also like to thank um, the former Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, for taking time to review the volume and to write uh, a very thoughtful um, introduction uh, to the volume. I'd also like to thank um, Arnold Ventures for its generous support of our reentry research and especially for the insights that Amy Solomon and Sibylla Catonius uh, provided throughout uh, the development of the working group and the edited volume. And finally, I'd like to recognize the, group, uh, the work of my team, uh, Caleb Seibert, Abby Jerome, and Jackson Garner, um, who worked a large number of small miracles um, in assembling um, the volume that you have uh, today. So before we start with today's program, uh, a few housekeeping items. We're going to have two panels, um, uh, one focusing on the big picture of underlying research, uh, and suggestions uh, for how program designers and evaluators might improve uh, implementation and evaluation of reentry programs. Gerard Robinson, my co AEI colleague, is going to be uh, moderating that panel. At the conclusion of that, we're going to take a brief break uh, to kind of reset for the second panel. So go get some more coffee, but don't like walk around the block. We, you know, come back, stay, stay here. Um, uh, and then uh, the second panel uh, will focus on research and strategies relating to fostering personal agency and, and uh, identity shift among incarcerated persons and returning citizens as a, as a key to successful reentry. And we're going to have time for Q&A with the panel uh, after each panel. So uh, there's one very important point I want to emphasize at the outset. Uh, I think that anyone who tells you that they have the answer to the reentry challenge is either unintentionally or intentionally putting you on. Rethinking reentry is not a consensus document. It's intended to surface a variety of perspectives to feed deliberation and try to spark innovation. As I said to my friend Dirk Van Velzen at the Prisoners, uh, Prison Scholars Fund in Seattle, reentry is a jigsaw, and every returnee is their own puzzle. To solve those puzzles will require innovation on the part of the criminal justice system and motivation on the part of men and women who are returning from prison to their families and communities. So to help put a frame around today's discussion, I'm honored to introduce now uh, Jocelyn Fontaine, uh, who is the Director of Criminal Justice Research at Arnold Ventures. 
Her work centers around identifying gaps in criminal research and ways in which research can inform public policy process in such areas as fines and fees, prison reform, community supervision, and reintegration. Jocelyn received her PhD in justice and public policy from the School of Public Affairs at American University. So please join me in welcoming Jocelyn to AEI. So um, Brent asked me to uh, provide a bit of a frame for the conversation today, both summarizing my reflections on the volume, which I have read, uh, uh, cover to cover, um, as well as what it means for our work at Arnold Ventures, as well as the criminal justice reform conversation broadly. Um, and I'm really thankful to be part of this conversation, um, uh, building on the support that my colleagues at Arnold Ventures gave throughout the development of this work. Um, and I'm really eager to hear from the panelists about their reflections on uh, pulling together the papers um, and what we know and don't know from the reentry literature. Um, so as Brent mentioned, I'm a research director at Arnold Ventures, where my primary responsibility is developing um, research investments uh, that are aligned with our strategic goals uh, in several areas. And um, the ones that are most relevant to this conversation is in the community supervision space, in prisons, and in reintegration. Um, at Arnold Ventures, uh, we are very focused on policy reform and the importance of research into informing that debate. And so our community supervision portfolio has the overarching goal of trying to advance policy and practice that reshapes community supervision to be about promoting success rather than simply catching failure. Our prisons work aims to change the policies and practices that make prisons inaccessible, inhumane, and ineffective. Um, and we really endeavor to support transformational change, which we think is what's needed, um, to increase transparency and accountability in prisons, uh, to change prison conditions, to support better reentry, uh, as well as to safely reduce uh, incarceration. And finally, our reintegration work aims to see policy and practice that improves um, or rather provides a pathway to opportunity for all of those who have had justice system involvement, uh, removing both the policy and structural barriers that impede successful reentry. Um, and so we're really happy to support this effort, really happy to be in this room. Um, it's nice to see that this volume has come together as being so widely uh, disseminated in uh, vehicles or forms like this. Um, so Arnold Ventures as a philanthropic organization, we were our Laura and John Arnold Foundation, we're now Arnold Ventures, um, and our mission to maximize opportunity and minimize injustice, uh, we're focused on supporting rigorous research, that's what we're known for, um, but really research that advances uh, better policy and practice. Our justice initiative, there's a lot of us, we're based in uh, New York City and here in DC, is motivated by the need uh, for criminal justice reform given the reality that our justice system uh, strips way too many people of their dignity. It has a disproportionate impact on people of color and those of lower incomes. It limits the potential of people who are in the system and it doesn't do a great job of giving people opportunities to succeed uh, once they return home to their communities after a period of incarceration. Uh, and of course it does all of this at tremendous cost to taxpayers. Um, our work is intended, again, to move the needle on policy and practice uh, as a mechanism to improve people's lives. And again, we see rigorous research as having a central role in that, uh, in that uh, conversation. Um, prior to coming to Arnold last spring, I spent more than a decade uh, at the, as a senior researcher at the Urban Institute. It's really nice to see a couple of my colleagues here. Um, and the bulk of my time, a little over a decade, was spent doing research and evaluation on reentry programs. So I have a bit uh, to say and have done a lot of thinking about this myself. Um, and I've done quite a bit of uh, multi-method, uh, comprehensive uh, evaluations of reentry programming, all types of reentry programming that had process uh, um, uh, outcome, impact, and cost uh, components. So again, it's nice to be here and to offer some of my reflections. Um, uh, I assume not everyone has read the volume, um, but my intention is not to summarize it for you, right, to encourage you to read it. Um, I think Brent does a really nice job of summarizing in the concluding chapter everything that's in it, and um, so I will not do that here, uh, but instead what I wanted to do was sort of offer up or lift up 
a couple of things uh, that I think are, are, are worth all of our consideration, and I'll leave it to the panelists to talk more about what they um, wrote uh, and, and their thinking about this issue. Um, the points that I want to lift up, and of course there's many in the volume, but I think um, these are the central ones because um, they resonate with work that I've done, and also I think they're uh, tremendously important for the justice system reform conversation. Um, so first, I've really appreciated several of the chapters uh, talk about the importance of implementation research um, and having a core set of implementation uh, measures and outcomes. Uh, Faye Taxman does this, Janine Buck Willison and Pam Lattimore do a wonderful job in the volume of talking about this, about the need for our research to really unpack the black box of what's happening in these programs that too often um, we don't really know what's leading to the success or a failure of a program when we just look at at the, at the Im impacts or the, or the outcomes, um, and that really, and, and, and Pam Lattimore does a great job of driving this point home, that often the failure to see uh, impacts is related to a failure of uh, implementation, and too often we just don't even know that because we're not measuring it. Um, relatedly, um, uh, Faye Taxman does a great job of uh, pointing out that so many organizations that are doing this work lack the necessary support uh, in order to get this stuff off the ground and to really do it well, and that's um, uh, even though they're trying, right? It's not a lack of trying, um, and that's due to a, a myriad of things such as staffing challenges, uh, staff attitudes about why we need to do this, how is this different from business as usual, uh, skill sets, um, maybe lacking the sufficient skills in order to, to, to really implement something with fidelity, uh, and then all of the internal workings of an agency that can really hinder progress on something. Um, there's also a lack of clarity often um, for reentry program implementers, uh, and this is mostly due to a lack of um, sufficient evidence on the topic about how services, when you're trying to do a lot, should be sequenced, how can they work together to form a more cohesive whole. So there's a really, there's a lot of uh, things sort of working against um, trying to do uh, implementation with fidelity, and again, that's not for lack of trying. Um, Third, I think in the, uh, the chapter by um, uh, Dr. Ed Latessa and Dr. Grant Dewey uh, do a wonderful job talking about the strong and compelling evidence uh, dis demonstrating the imperative of focusing, um, having a laser focus perhaps, um, our programming on risk of recidivism um, and the role of cognitive behavioral treatment um, in that in that. Uh, in that work, uh, that higher risk individuals uh, should be the ones that receive the most intensive programming uh, and treatment and services. Um, and though that there's a lot of needs, uh, we really need to be focused on those uh, that are related to risk of recidivism uh, and helping correctional agencies develop and design and implement assessment tools that help them do that. And finally, um, uh, and this was broadly mentioned throughout uh, the volume, and I'm sure will be talked about more, is uh, the key limitations of our current uh, research practices in this space. Um, uh, limitations not only due to our uh, not fully capturing what goes on with implementation, uh, but also due to inadequate sample sizes, the lack of sufficient power to assess uh, outcomes sufficiently long, follow-up periods or outcome periods, uh, and lack of more nuanced measures that can demonstrate success and understanding the role of recidivism and assistance. So uh, I said four things, and I could have said 20. Um, uh, but I think these are all such important insights. Um, and uh, again, there's others in the volume. But I raise them in particular because I think they're a product of the large scope of the problem um, and of the current uh, and pretty dramatic system failures. Um, Having experienced designing a large community-based reentry program uh, that I co-directed at Urban, and Christy Vischer was a part of this when she was there as well, we often discussed uh, four distinct uh, but interrelated and reinforcing reentry challenges, and I want to lift them up for the conversation today. The first, of course, is that individuals aren't prepared to navigate back into their communities for a host of reasons due to a lack of um, education, uh, job opportunities, poor physical and mental health, et cetera. Families that often provide the safety net for people um, struggle to address the needs of their family members coming home and then also have their own re um, challenges um, that they need to have met. Uh, communities are not properly prepared um, uh, to meet the complex needs of formerly incarcerated persons. They're both weakened by individuals criminal activity in neighborhoods and then burdened by their return. And then systems, both public and private, have not been well developed 
to provide coordinated supports for formerly incarcerated persons. And then across all of this, in this current policy landscape, all of these formal barriers uh, for individuals returning to society, voting restrictions, housing restrictions, job restrictions, as well as all of the squishier or more informal barriers to reentry, uh, such as nimbyism, stigma, uh, policymakers and practitioners using their discretion in order to keep people out of um, systems and uh, supports. So all of that combines to make reentry and reintegration really challenging uh, and extremely difficult, and hence uh, one of the reasons why we have such high rates of return that we do. Um, my experience in this space is, uh, like I said, building on uh, you know us framing this as being the challenge. Uh, we were fortunate. Um, uh, we had a big chunk of money from the Cartha Foundation to design a reentry program that would address all of that. Um, focused on one high density prisoner reentry neighborhood, use the best and promising evidence at the time to do everything that we can to tackle prisoner reentry in one uh, neighborhood in Chicago. Um, it was intended to include activities for individuals. It was intended to leverage the strengths of families and communities to support reintegration. Uh, and it was intended to develop supports uh, that would facilitate, um, public and private supports that would facilitate um, better reentry. And um, sadly, <laughs> a little bit, um, while the outcomes of the study were generally positive, it did reduce reincarcerations driven primarily through reductions in technical violations, the findings weren't as great as we had hoped for, or another way of saying that is sort of commensurate with the investment. It was a pretty big investment. It tried to do a lot of things, and what we got from that um, was a little bit disappointing, though generally positive. Um, the reasons for that were myriad, and this will resonate with um, uh, my, uh, my colleagues in the room here uh, who participated in the volume. Um, the challenges were due to the scope of individual and family challenges that the program, again, though well-intentioned and well-funded, well were not well-suited to manage and be responsive to. Implementation challenges over time, staffing issues, um, challenges with staffing and turnover, um, challenges due to service coordination due to all the different folks that were uh, trying to come together to get this work done. Um, and all of this led us to question uh, whether the program we designed was too complex and too complicated. Uh, and the answer of that, to course, of course, is yes and yes, right? Um, but doesn't it have to be given the scope of the problem? We also question our methods. Um, though they were rigorous, I believed in them. <laughs> I think we did a good job. Uh, there were several implementation failures that made evaluation just really difficult. Um, and in a lot of ways, our methods weren't well matched to what the program ended up looking like um, once it really reached uh, full implementation. Um, and so this all leads me to think about and want to raise up uh, Dr. Bushway's uh, point in the, um, in the volume, um, and I'm sure he'll talk about it more, um, is that evidence is supporting uh, that people do desist on their own. Um, they move to a pathway of um, uh, desisting from uh, reoffending, um, and uh, rather than... Um, uh, slowly declining to zero offending, they can do this pretty immediately. And that he's making the argument, and I, what I want to put in the room here today, is that policy should be constructed to account for that uh, possibility, even for those at the highest risk of um, recidivism, that they do desist and do nothing to disturb that process or interrupt that. Um, and that policy should recognize uh, that people have um, uh, undergo this process uh, and recognize their first steps to change uh, and support them um, uh, through policies that uh, reinforce those steps. I'm paraphrasing. He says it much better in the, in the document. Um, so these insights lead me to question the ability of policy and practice to do just that, um, to be responsive to the scope of the needs at all of these different levels, um, but be constructed such that they can account for people's, um, the possibility of desistance and not be disruptive to that process. I think that is actually quite a challenge. Um, so getting back to where I started then, and I'm almost done, the need for reform is quite clear. Uh, but given what we do and do not know, I'm curious to learn more about the role or rather the prescription uh, for corrections and community corrections policy uh, and practice, uh, given the complexity of the problem, the needs, and the evidence suggesting a focus on risk, um, and our lack of rigorous research that unpacks um, implementation successes, sequencing, and how you're the ingredients to success. Um, the justice system, you're in this room uh, because you know this, no doubt needs reform. 
um, and needs to provide a pathway to opportunity for those with justice system involvement. And so the findings and the recommendations in the current volume add tremendously to our understanding of how to inform policy, but I'm so hungry for more, as I know you all are too, more evidence that can inform policy, particularly in this current moment of criminal justice reform, uh, which is charging to be smaller, to be more humane and more equitable. Thank you. Bring our panelists to the to the front. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me also say Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New that year. time of the year. It's always good to be home at at, uh, at AEI. Uh, this is my uh, fourth year with our involvement. I can't think of a better way to start off a new year than to have a conversation about reentry, and particularly the book that we have here. I uh, want to thank Brett and his team for uh, Brett and his team for putting together this event, and more importantly, thanking the scholars for their their time to not only help put this together but also have a conversation. So, what I'm going to do is introduce each panelist afterward. Uh, each person uh, will talk about uh, her chapter, and then we'll have a moderated Q and A on stage, and then we'll open it up for audience Q and A. And so, without further ado, I'm going to start all the way to my right, uh, Pamela Lattimore, who is the senior director of research development at RTI, uh, where she's in the uh, Division for Applied Justice and Research. For over 35 years, she's had a strong focus on evaluation, also looking at programs to investigate causes and correlates to criminal justice. Uh, prior to joining RTI in 1998, she spent time with the National Institute of Justice, most recently as Director of Criminal Justice and Criminal Be Behavior Division. So she's uh, had a chance to see this in very unique ways. We then have Jean, uh, uh, Janine Buck-Wilson, uh, who's here from Urban Institute, where she's a research fellow for a Justice Policy Center, where she conducts research and evaluation on technical <coughs> assistance on improving the juvenile justice system. Her portfolio is uh, really unique in the aspect that she's looking at prisons and jails. We often talk about prisons only, not about jails. And also specialized courts, uh, corrections, and communities. When people leave, they often come back home to our communities, and we often think, ah, well, we're done with that. They're home. She's telling us, yeah, we've got to look at it a little differently. And then we have Faye uh, uh, Taxman, who's a university professor uh, not too far away from here at George Mason University, and also directs the Center for Advancing Correctional Excellence. Uh, she's a fellow at the American Society for, uh, of Criminology and received the Lifetime Award from the Division of Corrections and Sentencing. She too is involved in looking at big picture but also micro as relates to criminal justice and reentry. And she's gonna to talk to you about uh, her work. So what I'm gonna do is turn it over to you, uh, Pamela, and you can start us off. Thank you so much. I'm uh, really pleased to be here today. This has been an exciting uh, working group to be involved in. I've actually been involved in reentry research since 1984 uh, when I knew nothing about the criminal justice system. I was a PhD student in econ at Chapel Hill and um, sort of fell into the opportunity to be a program manager on a uh, what was not at that time known as a reentry program, but it was a an uh, integrated case management, job training, education, services delivery program in prison and out of prison for useful property offenders, basically 18 to 25 year olds. And that sort of, I guess, uh, caught my interest in terms of the whole field. I'm still here doing research in this many years later. Uh, and uh, over the course of the time since then, uh, in addition to that study, which was a randomized control trial, I've led m multiple multi-site, multimedia, multimodal uh, evaluations of reentry programs as well as uh, other types of criminal justice interventions, jail diversion, for example. I've done, uh, probably done work in 30 states, uh, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of subjects, uh, hundreds of thousands of interview interviews over the course of that and wrangling uh, databases from uh, lots of state, agencies, state and local agencies to get data to try to figure out what was going on. And it's, so it's from that perspective now that I've spent a lot of time, really I guess probably starting 10 years ago, trying to figure out what we've learned and what, what it all means basically. It's like, wait a minute, what does all this mean? And because 
as has been alluded to, and as I'm sure everybody in the room knows, uh, you know, the findings from these large studies have been mixed at best. Uh, we, we go out, as, as Jocelyn was talking about, with, we know what the problem is, we know how to fix it, we're going to put resources, and we're going to make it all better, and then it turns out for reasons we're not quite sure, but more work needs to be done on, we find out that, lo and behold, we're not as successful as we'd like to be. So succinctly, I mean, I think, you know, as has already been acknowledged, the problem is extraordinarily complex, complicated, and deep. People have tremendous needs who are involved in our criminal justice system. Uh, more to, more than the, one of the large studies I, that I did with many of the people in this room, actually, the multi-site evaluation of the Serious and Violent Offender Reentry Initiative, uh, we had more than 2,200 individuals, treatment and controls in, in comparisons in the study. And when these individuals got out of prison, 80% of them said, I need education. That's when they got out of prison. I need education. I need more job training. 60% of the women said, I need mental health treatment. I need substance abuse treatment. This is after incarceration. This is when they are supposedly have been helped, right? Some, some of these people were in reentry programs. They had, been, they had been helped, and they still came out of prison feeling like they had these deep needs. Um, <clears throat> and so, in, in, you know, 80% said they needed more education, but while they were in, in only 50% of them said that they got any education at all. So again, a gap between deeply expressed needs, widespread need, and, uh, and what was being delivered. You know, we did follow-up interviews at three, nine, and 15 months with, inter with individuals, and in those uh, interviews, so this was in prison. In prison, 50% said they got education. Once they got out, the number of services that being received was just paltry. I mean, we didn't even study the impact because so few people got services. Less than about 10% of the men and women post-release said that they got any education or job training services. So nothing, uh, you know, not much when they were incarcerated and, um, and uh, even fewer services once they got onto the outside. So big problem, lots of needs, not much being done about it. But this is where reentry came in. I enjoyed uh, uh, Brent's uh, discussion of uh, you know what happened in the early 2000s. Of course, Jeremy Travis, when he was at, at NIJ, and when Christy and I were there, uh, you know, was really when the focus came on reentry and what we should do about that. And so the idea was we need this sort of reentry, right, from prison through into the community. Uh, and there's been multiple federal initiatives. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent. Uh, to support programming in prisons and jails to try to um, improve uh, outcomes. Most recently, the Second Chance Act for state and local governments, and that goes on. Most of these initiatives have been out outcome-focused, basically do something to reduce recidivism, and, and, and then you know, or use evidence-based practices to reduce recidivism. Uh, I've preferred lately to use the word evidence-informed rather than evidence-based. I think that's more honest. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, these local designs should, you know, at least begin there. Many of these programs have been very short. Three years is really not enough to address these very complex issues. And if you think about the federal grant funding cycle, you get three years. That's why I'm so appreciative of like the, the study that Carrie Bet, uh, Pettis Davis is leading. That's a, like a 10, 15 year study to, with plenty of time to do pilot work, develop, uh, develop a program, pilot test the p components of it, build on it, and, you know, and, and follow people over long periods of time. And so three years from design, implementation, to the end of the evaluation, or even like with Savori, we had, I don't know, five or six years. It's still not a very long time to address these complex problems. And as a result, you know, as we've already noted, findings are often null, weak, or mixed. Um, particularly with respect to out, uh, recidivism outcomes. You, know, you see some glimmers of hope if you've got employment-focused programs. You'll see some improvement in, in, in employment. So you see a 10% improvement in employment for people who are in the, the programs versus those who are not. That's not nothing, right? I mean, that's actually important. But that 10% improvement in employment may not be enough to give you large reductions in recidivism, which is then, of course, what everybody focuses on. One of my frustrations when the Savori uh, uh, results were first coming out is that we did see some results on intermediate outcomes, but nobody cared, right? It was because we had, for the original study, we had positive but not significant recidivism findings. It was like, okay, well, 
we don't want to hear the rest of what you've got to say. And now maybe there was a little bit of improvement in drug use. Maybe there was a little bit of improvement in employment, which were, of course, what the programs were focused on fixing. But, you know, no result on recidivism, so let's move on. And um, so, um, you know, that to me, and I'll mention this a little bit more later, says, you know, we really need to start thinking, and I, when I say we, I mean me at least, we need to start thinking about how we talk about our findings in a way that's not just sort of, academic scientists, you know, surely everybody's going to read all of this, right? You know, and, and, and consider what all of this means, but to think about uh, the fact that, <clears throat> you know, how we say things may make a difference in terms of how the results were used. We did a longer term follow up of the Savori uh, subjects. You know, we saw no really basic impact at basically two years on uh, outcomes for individuals, men, women, and boys who'd been in Savori program compared to their comparisons. We did a five-year follow-up, and we found significant differences in post-release arrest for the, for the, we didn't do it for the boys because of issues to do with PII uh, identifiers, but for the, for the women and the men who had been in the Savory evaluation, the five-year follow-up found significant differences in the number of arrests following release. Now, that tells you two things. It was 14% fewer arrests for the men. That's a big number if you spread that over 1,600 people. And think about what that would translate to if you were delivering services to 100,000 people. So 14% reduction in arrest is important. For the women, it was 40% reduction, 40% fewer arrests. That's a really huge difference and, again, you know, could make a meaningful impact. Most of the people who were in the Savory study had at least one arrest. So when we focus on just this single up or down, fail or no fail, you know, die or don't die as an outcome, you know, it, it's taking away from uh, our ability to really understand improvement. And, you know, Sean can talk about, which I, I love his work on desistance and identity transformation. I think it's really important that we start doing more there. But, you know, if you understand that desistance can be a process, and not just a, a, a one-time thing. You know, if someone goes into prison committing 12 burglaries a, a month, mm -hmm. and they get out, and in a year they commit one, you know, a, a medical doctor would say, oh, one asthma attack in a year, this is fabulous. <laughs> you know, and we say, that person failed, right? And so, you know, I, those of you who know my work know I've done a lot of survival analysis, and you know, I look at time too, and numbers of, I've always looked at more complex measures of, of recidivism, but by and large, the field still focuses on this, you know, logistic regression, zero, one, in two years, did the person have an arrest or not? And it misses a whole lot of nuance that's incredibly important. I'm doing some pretrial work now, and it's even more important, because now you're talking about very short time periods and where you should be focused, and so you need to, to think about that. Um, the other aspect of the uh, longer-term follow-up with Savori is we found uh, that service-oriented pro uh, individual change programming, education, CBT, had an impact on, a positive impact on post-release. Um, uh, the, the more practical-oriented things did not, and in some cases they were actually even harmful, and, uh, which led Christy and me to have many long discussions about what can this possibly mean? This is significant and it's in the wrong direction, and these are the things that you know, everybody always thought were going to be helpful. And, um, you know, that's where we came to the conclusion that sort of being ready for change and the sequencing of change might be extraordinarily important, and we know nothing about that. So, um, you know, recommendations going forward, I mean, I think that we need to always go back to the basics. Uh, I think we need to um, uh, have a logic model. What's the theory of change? Think about whether the theory of change and the logic model actually imply a level of impact that is meaningful to measure. Uh, I think we need to be concerned when we are only able to design studies that are going to be underpowered, that we think about what that means, and that we're extraordinarily careful when we talk to policymakers about that. You know, if you've got if you can only afford a small sample, that has impact. If you could only look over a short period of time, that has impact. If your comparison with, uh, if, if you have incomplete implementation of your treatment, that has impact. If you're comparing to best practice, which means that your comparison subjects are getting something, that has impact. So these things have serious methodological implications for, uh, for the work that we do that, 
I, at least if speaking for myself, feel like I have, I have failed to realize what those mean when trying to talk to policymakers and practitioners, mm -hmm. that my attempt to apply these very rigorous standards uh, and, and to, to, to basically textbook standards, what the implications are. I mean, for years, I, I did a lot of work with probation, and I love talking to probation officers and people that are uh, in probation. But you know, tomorrow, they have to go out and do something. Right. It doesn't help if I come in and I say, well, what you've been doing the last three years didn't work any better than what you were doing the five years before that. And it's like they say, OK, well, that's not helpful. So we need to think about how we talk about those things. And um, uh, I think we need, as already Jocelyn, you know, and hopefully Sean will talk some more about that today, too. We really do need to understand assistance okay. and that people wanting to change may be, nece be necessary. It might not be sufficient to get to a no offending, but it's got, it may be necessary. And I've thought for a long time that the factors that were associated with assistance were um, okay. different than the factors that were associated with recidivism. I, had, I was having a conversation yesterday with a colleague who was talking about some uh, interviews that she had done with um, uh, male former prisoners who had gotten really engaged with their fatherhood experiences. And, mm -hmm. and that completely transformed their lives. So identity, they start to transform their life as, oh, they see themselves as a father now, not as you know somebody in, in a gang. And that has right. forced them to make changes. So okay. um, that's uh, it. I think we need to be patient. Uh, no silver bullets, no aluminum bullets, which are cheaper and as effective <laughs> as silver. And so uh, you know, I think that that's uh, what we may need to look for. And no pun intended on bullets and reentry yeah. as we're having this yeah. conversation. Yeah. 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 Exactly. exactly. Thank you, Pamela. Yes, thank you. Okay. Janine. Thanks so much. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today. And um, I know that my co-author, Nancy Levine, is sad that she couldn't join us today. But uh, I'm glad to be here and talk a little bit about our essay, which makes the case for incorporating the experiences and perspectives of program participants, staff, and developers, people with lived experience or that professional experience, um, into evaluation and program design in order to really, I think, we think, help address some of the shortcomings that have been alluded to already and that Pam uh, just talked uh, a little bit about. Um, we believe that doing so is, will provide the critical program context uh, relevant to accurately really understand and assess um, reentry program operations, including fidelity, as well as to aid in more, more robust and nuanced and maybe um, more meaningful measurements <laughs> to get at some of these interim yeah. kinds of measures of success and outcome and to really try and understand those causal pathways a little bit better toward the ultimate outcomes that we're looking for with reentry. Um, and to also, I think, um, play an important role in helping us really ground truth and interpret mm -hmm. some of those findings. And those observations or the observations that we offer and the recommendations that we offer in our chapter um, are really drawn from Urban's experience uh, and our work in designing and populating the What Works in Reentry uh, Clearinghouse, a systematic review platform in which we looked at uh, a number of reentry studies, kind of the um, body of research at the time that was out there that met a, a standard of, of rigor and uh, looking at their outcomes, um, but also just from our firsthand experience in evaluating holistic reentry programs like the Second Chance Act, as well as um, some others, and, and really taking uh, our reflections as we looked at what have we learned from this, what, what, what can we learn from these mixed findings. So I won't get into the, I think it's clear that we have lots of mixed findings around reentry, uh, and it's not necessarily totally clear why. Um, at the same time, uh, it does seem that as we reflected on the research, that a level of rigor has been, evaluate, uh, has been elevated, and methodological rigor is certainly very important. But as we were looking at um, the landscape or scope of reentry studies that did meet that level of rigor, um, we noticed that only really a handful discussed um, program implementation or provided context around program implementation. So we really feel like Without that, it's very hard to get a thorough understanding of the nuances and limitations around program content and delivery and to extract instructive lessons for um, program design or future evaluation. So as a result, I think what we're hearing today is that uh, program developers, funders, and people on the ground 
aren't necessarily, aren't necessarily sure what to extract in terms of what works and what should we replicate going forward. So again, the premise of our chapter is by incorporating the voices of program participants as well as program staff that are implementing these programs and developers both at the critical uh, evaluation design stage but also at the program design stage that we can hopefully fill some of those gaps and have more instructive lessons. And so, so one of, some of what we've offered um, in our chapter quickly um, is uh, making the recommendation obviously to include people both professional and lived experience in the program design um, and evaluation. So in order to close those gaps. And how can we do that? We think the participants, by soliciting the experiences and perspectives of people with lived experience, people who have been incarcerated, who are experiencing uh, reentry, can offer um, some really important lessons learned for us around how they define program success and the sal salient factors that will contribute to it, including helping to identify additional measures that may illuminate, I think, the presumed causal uh, connections between reentry services and crime-free living. It can help us unearth some of those intermediate measures of success that we would posit are important, yet we don't really know how they factor into kind of the, the causal pathway toward the end outcomes right now, much of what we measure, right? As Pam alluded to and others, is um, the, the key measure of reentry success is really recidivism. And yet, I think we, in our evaluations and looking for that, and, and it's important that we look at recidivism, and it's important that we look at other kinds of related outcomes like housing stability and employment that we know play an important role um, toward crime-free living, or we posit that. I think we're still exploring exactly how that fits together. Um, but making room for both understanding from the participant's perspective what's important, how they would define reentry success or what contributes to that, but also how we factor into our calculus, if you will, some of the intermediate and important measure um, successes. So for example, someone getting their GED is, a, is, a, is an important success. It's a huge success for someone. Someone who's taking their medication consistently when they have a behavioral health issue. Those are important. Understanding kind of how those factor together to put someone on a pathway toward the ultimate, I think, stability, is, uh, which is what reentry is looking for in the community, isn't really well known, and we need to um, we need to explore that more. And people with lived experience can be really helpful, I think, in that. Um, also, consulting with staff and program developers, engaging with program staff, and doing that both as a reentry evaluation, both formatively, but also can help us understand implementation fidelity, including adherence to and departures right from the specified model, identifying how well staff understand the objectives of the reentry program and the key components of it, and what they should be implementing and why, and do they have the training, which I think um, Faye will be talking a little bit about. Um, so collecting that, documenting that, understanding how that all fits together, where there's buy-in. I think a lot of times our evaluations assume that there can be buy-in from staff, and yet Factoring that into our evaluation can really provide a lot of helpful context and understanding where we may end up in terms of end outcomes. Um, you know, for both program staff and participants, um, they can help us, as I alluded to, I think fill gaps around uh, measurement. Again, thinking about how we define success, but also how are, you know, a key gap or something we struggled with in our recent evaluation of second chance re um, reentry programs is really understanding what are people getting? I think there's a presumption that we have these comprehensive, um, multi-factor um, programs and that everybody's getting something. We don't necessarily know exactly what people are getting, how much they're getting, uh, and that has implications for understanding what should be offered, for how long, in what sequence. Um, and that is, I think, a big gap in our understanding and something that, again, by consulting more closely with staff and people with lived experience to really understand that, but also understand how meaningful those programs were and the sequencing of that could really help inform our about and strengthen our evaluations going forward. Um, you know, all of this and some of the ways we can do that is by, you know, uh, interviewing individuals. We often do that, but we're doing it more to kind of gap fill, I think, some of our data rather than really consulting and bringing people in at the beginning to both design evaluation and programs. Obviously, through things like focus groups. Um, there are a number of methods or data collection in which we can engage people. I think it would be great to see that more prominently, and we make the case for doing so in our chapter. Um, and again, some of this, of course, is both about the data and, and information. It's also, as we've alluded to, about having longer timelines. I think 
Um, some of this will require uh, inviting people again into the program design. So not just coming in and evaluating after something's been implemented, but really um, bringing people together to help understand and inform that design as well as inform the evaluation. So again, I think we need longer periods of time for that. It would change our model a little bit in terms of the way that we approach evaluation, but we think it would be, it's important to make sure that those voices are heard and incorporated in a meaningful way as we go forward. So those are kind of the key takeaways from our piece. Thank you, Janine. Um, well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me today to talk about my chapter. Um, so I introduce in my chapter some new scientific methods of basically looking at this age-old problem, which is, you know, null effects, the interpretation that nothing works, this focus on attention that, you know, these programs are not doing what they, we hope that they would do. Um, so, you know, I, I, I call this the age-old problem because when I started my career in the 1970s, to date myself a little, um, there was the famous Robert Martinson report that got released, which is kind of a prelude to kind of the, one of the largest first meta-analysis on the field of correctional programming. And his interpretation, minus some statistical problems that were occurred at that time, but was basically that nothing worked and, you know, these programs didn't make a difference. Um, and, you know, that's where I started my career. Um, and soon after that report, which of course rocked the field of criminal justice and sort of helped to contribute to a move away from rehabilitation to more deterrence and incapacitation models and some retributive justice models, um, was also the fact that hidden in there was this theme, well, maybe nothing's implemented. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for uh, those of you, you know, who haven't read his report, it's actually really interesting because he talks about the fact that, you know, there is this issue that when you bring in new programs, the question is, is how different are they than standard practice? How much dent have they made actually in the work that people do on a daily basis, the culture of an agency, the efforts, and actually to bring that as sort of normal practice within an agency. And of course, when you're doing an experiment, um, you know, which all of us have done, um, what really happens is we're introducing something new, we're testing it out. But we're testing it out in, under conditions in which we don't want it to be too normalized, right? So the organization can't really adapt because we have to have our comparison groups or our control groups. Um, and so they're innovative ideas. They're presented as to the organization as an innovation that we're testing to kind of see if it makes a difference. Um, and you know, therein causes a little bit of the problem in the sense that when we are trying to actually have a true comparison or control group, we're not actually asking the innovation to change total practice of how correctional officers, probation officers, or treatment providers mm -hmm. really do their work, okay? So, you know, and um, so Martinson set the tone. He set the tone by basically saying nothing works. There's another um, scholar by the name of Ted Palmer, also worth reading. He has a really um, great book that came out in the early 1990s called Programmatic and Non-Programmatic Factors That Affect Correctional Programming. And he set the tone also that we really need to have a better understanding of the organizational context and how that influences whether, whether what the innovation is or what gets put in place is really something different than standard practice. Um, so, you know, my work has been basically in this area both of testing innovations and doing true experimental designs, but over the last 15 years or so, I've started working much more in the area of really looking at um, how to change practice within organizations, how to get a better hold of um, what are the attitudes and beliefs that affect practices in you know normal everyday settings, probation offices. That's where I primarily have done my work, but also in prisons and jails. Um, in the field of healthcare, 
Uh, the area of implementation science emerged about 20 some odd years ago, um, primarily to solve the problem of also in that industry, you know, change of organizations and practices among doctors, probably some of the most schooled people in our society, is still slow to occur, right? It takes 17 years or so to be, and this is what the statistics are, to go from you know, a new idea to actually changing clinical practice. And oh, by the way, they only change about 14% of what was actually recommended. So you still have another problem, is they're not really putting everything in place. Um, so my chapter is to force us to kind of begin to think about doing more of what people have talked, Brent talked about it, um, Jocelyn spoke about it, this notion um, about implementation, understanding implementation, and maybe turning our attention instead of doing the great RCT to find out if something works, is really doing more RCTs around how to change organizations, how to have an impact on the staff that are responsible for delivering these services, um, how to move ourselves into taking an idea and actually transporting it into an organization in a way that it can actually have an impact. So there's a, a, an emerging science. Um, uh, Steve Belinko and I wrote a book, uh, uh, I guess it's almost five or six years ago, on implementation um, in uh, community-based and addiction uh, treatment settings. Uh, and that was all about looking at the different practices of how to actually do implementation science within the areas um, related to correctional and uh, particularly substance abuse treatment programming. Um, so we need to study how to change organizations. We don't have a lot of knowledge. Uh, current practice now is we do a lot of training. We do a lot of technical assistance. We don't know if that works. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that would suggest that, that, that we don't really make a dent. We're just basically checking boxes when we do some of these activities. Um, uh, uh, there's a saying within the technical assistance field that it's practitioners helping practitioners. And I'm like, helping for what? <laughs> like, what are we trying to achieve here? Where are we going here, right? Like, um, so, you know, and, and, and I think it's really important for us to take a step back instead of sort of thinking about, okay, we failed at this program, but actually, did we even give the programs any chance to be fully implemented the way we've done our sort of technical assistance mindset? Um, so implementation science basically has a different premise than a lot of RCTs on program outcomes. The premise is not about replicating you know, a program that was proven in another setting or a program that was proven in one prison system versus another. Implementation science basically is based on the premise of transportability. How do you transport an idea into a culture in which you can actually um, influence the attitudes and values within that particular culture to support what you're trying to do? Um, so, you know, in, in our field, cognitive behavioral um, treatment programs are considered the best practice, the most effective interventions. Um, but one of the things you know, we've done in delivering those services, in some places we have correctional officers who deliver the services, who were lucky enough to get a two-day training program in the program. Kind of being a little <laughs> silly here, but you know, it's not that far from reality in mm -hmm. some places. Um, and then we're asking them to actually do psychological sciences, helping people learn to change, helping people facilitate change. Well, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to question whether or not that's a good implementation of a, a complicated clinical technique called cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but yet that's one of our practices. So, you know, some of the recommendations in my chapter are really thinking much more clearly about the question about the design of what we're trying to do, whether it's CBT or you know, a vocational education program <clears throat> or offering case management services, 
So the design, then thinking about the setting, the, the internal setting, this is the terminology used in implementation science or inner setting that has to do with the organization that's responsible for delivering those services and what the staff attitudes are, what the staff educational levels are, mm -hmm. what their capabilities are. Then the next piece is thinking about the outer setting, which actually is this notion about the support that these organizations need to do the work that we're asking them to do. Um, you know, do the judges support this? Do the, does the legislature support mm -hmm. this? How much money are they actually giving them to do this? Which Pam would tell us. Yeah. Sorry, this thing seems so uh, Which Pam would tell us is, you know, I think in your Savory, you found what, an average of $800 yeah, per $1, person? Per yeah, dollars Yeah, I mean, you on know, a good day. on yeah, a good yeah, day, yeah, right? Yeah. So, but what are those yeah, external supports? And it's important to know that because we do know that change actually in an organization oftentimes is pushed from the outside, mm -hmm. um, and that's the first leverage point. But the, the, the internal setting has to be able to respond to that. So they see the mixed messages. We want you to do a CBT program. We're only giving you $2 extra in your budget. You know, So those kind of conflicts. And then the last part that implementation science does is it basically asks the questions of, how are you going to change the organization? What's the processes that you're going to go through to do that? And there are some recommendations. They're called quality improvement processes. Mm -hmm. There's pretty robust literature. Again, not necessarily in CJ, not well um, actually implemented in CJ. Um, but it gives us an opportunity to really look at different types of outcomes and think about how do you transport an idea, not replicate, transport it into these complex everyday worlds that we live in? Um, so that's one advantage of implementation science. The second advantage or area that I wanted to focus on was the interventions themselves. So a lot of our interventions, we'll CBT, OK, I'm Russian. <laughs> uh, CBT, you know, basically, again, how compatible is that to the act, what we're trying to implement? And what intervention science basically does is it basically tries to give us the opportunity to look more closely at what are the mechanisms of change. So, for example, you know, going to um, you know uh, some of the work that Sean's done. Sean's talked about signaling. What are individual signals that tell us that people mm -hmm. are on a different pathway? Well, we want to know which intervention parts contribute to those pathways. So last, I want to also mention um, that, you know, and Jocelyn mentioned this in, in her introduction, my chapter also goes through different outcome measures that we should be thinking about, not at the individual level, but actually at the, in, at the program level or the organizational level. So one thing we've learned, and I'll conclude with this, is you know we think that staff understand these new ideas about reentry or case management, or um, but we've actually learned in a lot of our work that people don't understand mm -hmm. what they are. They think of it as just like oh, it's just the same thing. They just have a new name, mm -hmm. right? So we have to do much more in terms of knowledge building to help staff feel confident mm -hmm. that they can deliver these. Mm -hmm. So my chapter, again, is to help you think about some new ways we can pursue our research, um, but also think about ways to pursue change within the criminal justice environment. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Faye. And glad she mentioned health. She's also co-editor of uh, Health and Justice. So <laughs> Thank you. a couple of things come to mind. Uh, when Brent opened up in, his, uh, in the beginning, he talked about the Scarlet Letter. And if you're involved in reentry, you know the Scarlet Letter F, felon. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Hearing uh, Jocelyn and her opening, she talked about Chicago and what happened there. And then I'm thinking about the three chapters. Each one of you focused on another Scarlet Letter in research and evaluation. It's called I for implementation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what do we, what, you know, 20 plus years ago we said we should do this, it would work. We're now 2020. I'd like each one of you to kind of focus on why do you think we're still questioning or possibly not getting things right about implementation? Something we can do differently. You've hinted at it. 
You've talked about it in your chapters, but there's one thing you had to tell, let's say, the people in this room to think about the scarlet letter I, because it's going to come up in 2040. What could we do? Okay, so uh, I will give you my radical thought. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Sorry, Brent. <laughs> uh, which is, I think that as a society, we need to come to terms with what we really expect out of our criminal justice system. And okay. I'm, you know, we talk about the criminal justice system having you know, multiple purposes, punishment, mm -hmm. you know, retribution, incapacitation, deterrence, rehabilitation. And uh, they talked about the dollars and resources that were dedicated to program implementation. And I think a, a failure of us as a society to acknowledge the depth of the problems that the individuals have and what it's going to take to actually repair and help them get on a proper path uh, requires resources that uh, oftentimes are not available. And an assumption that, oh, the resources are there somewhere, y'all just find them. And mm -hmm. then when you couple that with what you know, Faye was talking about. And that, so that's one. So I think it's a societal mm -hmm. issue. And the other is I think it's very much related to this notion of desistance and trying to understand what we can do as a society to encourage people to, to feel like it's worth it for them to invest in making changes in, in themselves going forward. I like that. And mm -hmm. I guess building on that, I think of another resource is time, yep. right? And so thinking about adequate time or sufficient time um, to really accomplish what we're trying to accomplish, and it, yep. it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of time, yep. um, both to you know for change to manifest, but also to create, I think, or help change. Mm -hmm. And you think about implementation. Part of it is really taking, being very intentional. I think looking at that and then evaluating, but allowing time, which I think is a resource we don't often. Allow for. So, and I think about, um, I think implementation is tied into our perspective of whether we considered the non attorneys <laughs> that work mm -hmm. in the justice system mm -hmm. to be professionals. Mm -hmm. Do we consider correctional officers, probation officers, case managers to be professionals? And I think, um, I don't think we do. I think we consider it a job for people. Um, and by us not valuing the people who are you know, in the day-to-day, -day, the frontline workers, um, we end up with a situation in which the organization doesn't really support them, nor does the justice system. I mean, when, you know, if we look at a lot of the implementation work, Implementation is really about the people who work on the front lines and mm -hmm. how they interact with people. And we don't train people on the same skills that even police officers get, right? Police officers get training on interrogation. They get training on how to interact with citizens. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just in the last 10 years or so that some of these other organizations, uh, corrections agencies, are starting to be able to uh, say, okay, maybe we need to change how we do some of our training, staff development. So to me, the, whole, the issue, I think, has to do with professionalism mm -hmm. and whether we value the work of people who work on the front lines mm -hmm. in the corrections and of the system or the, you know, the, the non-attorney part. Mm -hmm. um, can I, and, and what I said I think is related to what you, the, the, the intersection there oh, yeah. is, is if, if, the goal, if the job of a correctional officer is security and to be mean to people because you want punishment out of your criminal justice system, that, that says something about training and expectations mm -hmm. for the job as opposed to um, a more your job is to make a positive impact on the lives of the people that you're taking uh, care of. Uh, and then what does that imply in terms of the resources that should go into the training of those officers and the expectations? Yeah, I mean, if you look at, you know, we're, we're, a lot of places are looking at Norway mm -hmm. as sort of having this different framework for how they do justice and corrections. And the role of the correctional officers and who they are and how they're trained and what the job expectations are are so different. Sure. I mean, we're only 10 years or less away from calling correctional officers, guards, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of people's minds, they're still guarding guards. us from yeah. 
these bad mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in Norway, you know, the correctional officer's role is much more about reforming people and about having good interactions with clients or people who are incarcerated mm -hmm. so that they can actually reframe how they interact with other people. Um, so, you know, and I do think also, I mean, what Pam said about it being a value system, I actually think, you know, we don't want to spend the money on this end of the system, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, because these people are supposedly failures in life. But, um, you know, and if we actually trace, we know that, you know, that actually people actually were failures from all the other systems beforehand. I mean, one of the things that Sean did at one of our first meetings was basically asked us the question, um, you know, what percentage of people who are in prison actually have worked in a legitimate job before they were incarcerated? Um, I'll let Sean tell that story. <laughs> but it, for me, it was like a reframing because I, one, hadn't thought about that, but then mm. it really helped us <laughs> really think about the fact mm. that people, you know, don't have the same opportunities many of us in this room have. One consistent letter I see here, we have F, we have I, and now it's going to be R, which is resources, okay. whether it's economic, whether it's time, or whether it's human involved. I've got a question uh, for each person up here, but I'm going to put that in my back pocket for now because I want to make it interactive with those of you who are in the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand. Have two things. Give us your name and affiliation. And number two, ask a question, not give a speech. And so we've got someone here in the middle. We'll have a mic come over to you. We'll go here, and then I'll go to my left. Uh, good afternoon, Stefan Labulio, and sort of uh, uh, piggybacking on Gerard's question, I feel like we've been stuck in the same conversation for 20 years about implementation issues and uh, um, all sorts of things. I wonder, in this mecca of libertarianism, where we are now in AEI, do we need to sort of fundamentally ask the question, is the federal government also just bad at choosing which programs to fund? Um, we've put a billion dollars into reentry through labor and justice over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, almost $200 million each year, would that money be better allocated at the state and local level where reentry occurs? And I wonder if that is something that sort of needs to, sort of further uh, conversation. Uh, I mean, one of my concerns is that I don't mind failure. It's part of the entrepreneurial process, but I don't see the failures as having strengthened the reentry networks at the local and state level. Uh, instead, the money is spent. When it is spent, it's gone and nothing remains. And I think um, we should be really rethinking how the federal government's role in, in choosing where, uh, which programs to fund. I think uh, state and po local policymakers are in a much better um, uh, uh, position to make those decisions. So I'd love your comments. And for those in the viewing audience, Stefan has been involved for a number of years and worked in Maryland early years and also talked about the importance of uh, ABD, higher education, GED, and others. Whoever wants to start off. I'll start off. So historically, you know, we did this in the addiction treatment centers um, in the 1970s, um, you know, <clears throat> under President Nixon. He put in place a lot of addiction treatment centers around the US, primarily to deal with Vietnam vets who were coming home, but it really spurred outpatient treatment programs um, in the 70s. Um, you know, 10 years later, um, you know, uh, President Reagan basically took those funds and gave them to state and local agencies. Also, unfortunately, during that period of time, rolled back the amount of funds that were available as block grants. Um, so now we're at a state where, you know, state and local governments don't really have the resources to put in place good quality addiction treatment programs. Um, we're constantly struggling with that. Um, and there's no, you know, other than some of the work that, you know, we've all done or the National Institute on Health has done to try and identify new addiction treatment programs, state and local governments can't make that investment. Um, so I, I don't think it's an either or. Um, I think, you know, block grants have some value or not, but I think we really have to look at the addiction treatment system and what would actually happen there 
to ask the question, if we gave all the money that BJA you know, gets for demonstration projects or labor gets for demonstration, would we actually get what we're looking for here? And I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. And, you know, and I mean, the, for, on the, I, I think there's a difference basically in, in sort of how the labor uh, programs have worked and how the justice funded program, mm -hmm. DOJ funded programs have worked because most of the, uh, like the Second Chance Act and Savory and those programs have relied on local design of programs. Mm -hmm. right. You know, I, I've described these initiatives as outcome focused. It's like they, they might have two or three criteria or parameters set around them, like Savory was supposed to be 35 and younger and violent offenders, high risk violent offenders. But, you know, so there might be a few criteria, but it was up to the state and locals to design their programs. And, uh, and then that's where you run headlong into the issues we've all talked about here, which is very short time frames. And you know, I'm I'm a state agency, and I've gotten I'm lucky enough to have gotten a BJA grant to to set up a reentry program, and I've got six months to design it. That means I've got to figure out institutional programming. I've got to figure out you know community-based programming. I got to figure out how I'm going to identify the people that are going to go into it. I've got to make all these decisions, implement it, get it started. You know, encounter all the stuff that Faye was talking about, and others have talked about this morning, and you know, and then in two years, I'm supposed to see, you know, big impacts. And so, the, again, we're on the R word, right? The mm -hmm. time, time, and even if there's adequate money, the lack of time, the lack of the human resources sort of run head on. And, you know, and as they get, you know, as these programs, I mean, you can talk, the, I mean, I'm sure you have. We've talked to people out in these state agencies, and they are looking at what the next funding stream is going to be. And oftentimes it's like, well, they do do what they was talking about. They say, well, this, this year we're doing ABC program. Next year we're going right. to be doing DEF program, which looks an awful lot like ABC program, <laughs> but now we've had to take this part out or stick this part in, and we're going to do that for three years, and then we go on to the next thing. So, so I mean, I do think and it would be actually really interesting to try to drill down as far as you could into all of these hundreds mm -hmm. of reentry programs that have been funded by BJA over the last 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And if, if it was possible to sort of do a meta-analysis of all of these programs in some way to see if, if maybe there are some really bright spots in there that we just haven't been able to see because of the way you know, time and other things have forced us to look at these issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, and I think especially highlighting there is a lot of flexibility at the BJA program yeah. uh, funding streams. You know, they provide principles that sites should yeah. organize around. But um, to your point about you know it does take all that time to get them organized to build those collaborations, and then thinking about how much time you have to actually to have burn in of the program, right? right. And then right. it's over, and you're so you're yeah. always going to the next kind of funding stream to to gap fill that. And I think not having it's hard to see it for people to have that local vision of what they're really building, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and at the same time, research comes out and says this is the next best kind of best practice. And so everyone's trying to adapt that too. And I think it makes it difficult. One of the great things about me being a moderator is the opportunity to help shape the dialogue. And the second part is to be the heavy. And so I've got to be the heavy right now and okay. say that we're going to actually have to uh, end this panel. And there's a gentleman of a question over here, so at some point maybe you can ask them uh, during the break. Uh, so there are a few housekeeping notes before I officially end. Uh, we're going to have a 10-minute break, and so we'd like everyone to get coffee, other goodies, and stay around, uh, and then we'll come back. What I want to do is to thank each uh, member for the panel, for the chapter that she put into the, to the book, Rethinking Reentry. Re when I read each chapter, I began to think a lot more about anthropology. And anthropology is a study of humans. We often call ourselves human beings, but what we are are humans, being. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so in the yeah. being part, how do we look at the resources of implementation? And I think they provide very good resources to take a look at. So let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you.
Okay, we're gonna get started here in about two minutes, so please get your coffee and make your way back to your seats. Um, <clears throat> we wanna make sure we have enough time for a robust discussion. Um, I love the sound of all of your voices talking. Uh, and uh, I want those voices back in the room and in their chairs so we can proceed with um, the rest of the program. Mike Frank is, uh, is ignoring me and my pleas for order. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> my turn to play the heavy. Everybody, please come back in, have a seat. Um, <clears throat> I, I uh, the, the first panel uh, really, I think, laid out a very um, interesting, uh, I won't say clear picture, because I don't think it is clear. I think it, uh, it, it, it helped us to see some of the complexity and the, and the layers and levels of um, change um, that are required in order to make uh, programs work and help people. And, um, and it's a, it's a a daunting prospect, um, what's been, what the first panel laid out uh, in terms of the challenges and the opportunities. So the second panel uh, today, and uh, the, the bios of all of the, speak, or all of the speakers and the writers for the volume are in the back. I'm not going to labor over our speakers' bios. They're both great, uh, Sean Bushway and uh, Christy Vischer, uh, and have done amazing and significant work in this field, in the fields of criminology and reentry and uh, criminal justice reform. Um, <clears throat> but in this panel, we want to have just a little bit different angle on the conversation, which is really about trying to pick out those themes that we, some of the themes that were surfaced in the first discussion about desistance and identity change. And, uh, uh, these two scholars um, have done uh, amazing work around those ideas, and so that's what we're going to focus on in this um, in this next um, panel. Because I think it's so important um, that while we while we get better at what we're doing, try to get better at what we're doing in terms of programs, um, that we also think more deeply and more seriously about the people. Um, that are uh, in the criminal justice system and what um, their role is in their own uh, reentry. So with that, I'm going to uh, start with Sean uh, to talk about his paper, and then we'll have Christy talk about hers. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me. Um, the very first time um, I ever spoke to a non-academic audience was back in 1998, when I was a professor at the University of Maryland as an assistant professor, and I had been part of the sort of What Works um, uh, initiative at Maryland, where Congress went and said, what programs work to prevent crime and reduce recidivism in correctional departments and, and criminal justice more broadly? And we generated a report. I was in charge of the chapter on labor market programs, both in prison and outside of prison, and we basically concluded very little worked. And so um, we started, the, the, the document's been cited thousands of times. At the time, we started going to different communities, different groups to talk about our, our report. And I was asked uh, to go, as, as the junior member of the team, I was sent to Ocean City, Maryland, to talk to the Correctional Officers Association of the, of the Atlantic Coast. Um, it's the only time I was ever the smallest guy in the room. <laughs> um, and I got up there all year, and I talked about randomized control trials, and I said, nothing works. Um, and um, I got yelled at by a very angry person 
who, 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 who very stridently and very emotionally said, what are you talking about nothing works? I work with these guys. They, they go out, and they're successful, and I know it. And you're telling me it doesn't work. You're wrong. So of course, I'm a highly educated, statistically trained professor. I think to myself on the very traumatic ride home that, I'm, that this person just doesn't understand statistics. This is all selection bias. And, uh, and clearly, they're just wrong. And gee, wouldn't it be nice if everyone understood statistics? But it, but it bothered me, and it's continued to bother me for years. And I started thinking, to, I'm trying to understand what he, what he was saying. And, and what he was saying was, when he heard nothing works, he heard everybody fails. And everyone doesn't fail. And in fact, that narrative that everyone coming out of prison fails is actually factually wrong. Um, and sometimes that's perpetrated by looking at recidivism statistics of release cohorts. And there's a very important study by Bill Rhodes that said, look, we're not talking about, when you talk about everybody fails, you, you mean everybody that goes to prison, right? That's not who gets released from prison in any given year. And if you look at that, the majority of people who go to prison never come back to prison. Actually, everyone doesn't fail. Um, and when you do recidivism studies, statistical, very rigorous statistical studies trying to follow people over the long term, if you assume everyone fails, you will not get a good model. In fact, over and over and over again, we know that models have to assume that some people don't fail. And we can actually estimate that. Uh, and I've done that work in a very technical way. And the reality is, everyone doesn't fail. He's right. So then the question is, well, maybe it's just these people were not going to fail. They were, so why didn't the program work? Well, maybe these guys were really low risk. They got kind of incarcerated by accident. Um, and uh, they were going to be good, upstanding citizens anyways. Well, that's not true either. Um, if you look at even people that are very high rate offenders before they go to prison, a substantial proportion of them um, appear to stop offending. In other words, they do not continue on the, on the same trajectory. Um, and that's real. And I got that point made to me in, very, very, uh, in a very uh, sort of strong way, um, in a personal way, i.e., um, I had a home renovation project that I decided I wanted to do. Um, and I hired this guy that had been working around in the neighborhood to do a $100,000 kitchen renovation in my house. Uh, we, he was an amazing guy, kitchen and three bathrooms. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, And so we, we, we were doing this. And we, we liked this guy so much. He got such great recommendations, we hired him. Um, did a great job. Came to the house once when the bees were in the house. He fixed it. He was amazing. Subsequently, I was at a, an event at my church, and he came to speak about what it's like to re-enter, because he'd been in prison three times um, seri for a serious offender. And, if you and I, of course, looked up his past. And if you did a risk assessment on him when he exited prison the last time, he was very high risk. Hasn't offended for 20 years, ran a successful business. Um, what's going on? People do change. We may not know how to make them do it. But the reality is, they do. Not everyone, but a substantial proportion. And so in my work, I started looking at that and thinking about what that looks like. And this idea of identity change becomes a really important part of the story. People, uh, there are some people that are sort of in, in prison and an aberration, but there's a large number of people that were on a particular path and they moved to a different one um, through some type of identity transformation that they themselves can talk about. And so the question then becomes, well, we don't, can we engage a little bit more about how to help that process? And I think the answer, and that's part of what I, I hear other people in, on the panels talking about. But at the very least, we should construct policies that don't, uh, that do, don't interrupt that process. Because it, it is, in fact, the case. If you give lots of people jobs as coming out of prison, it doesn't seem to help much. But I can show you data that shows if you look at people who have records who do get jobs, apply for get jobs, get them, start to work on them, and then you fire them because of their record, you will increase their recidivism. Right? So you can screw up the process that they're on. Um, and at the very le and, and uh, an excessive focus on risk, which again is your past trajectory, doesn't allow for the fact that you may be on a different one. So I think that it's worth thinking about what would it look like to interpret evidence 
in such a way uh, that you allowed for the fact that there to be people who were actually changing. And actually, this becomes pretty interesting because if you think about it, do you need, for example, to supervise high-risk people, high-rate offenders, people that had previously high-rate offending, for longer periods of time than low rates? Because obviously they're high-rate, right? The answer is no. Why? Because if they're high-rate, they're going to fail fast. And if they don't fail, they're telling you something, which is they've made some process, they've, they've entered on a process of change. Counterintuitive, but realistic, if you remember that there are actually two things we have to focus on when people are coming out of prison. One is their rate, their risk, and the other is the possibility that they've changed. And so I think that that exercise of thinking about, so there's two components of it is, we may not know how to do it, but the reality is people are changing. Second is, and, and so therefore, how do we accommodate the process and support it? Because we can screw it up. And then the second piece is, are there things that we can do to help make that process better, easier, allow more people to enter that, that, that change process? And I think both of them are important. I've been focusing in my essay on the second one. I think the evidence is overwhelming that there is identity transformation. Um, and that this is an important part of the process and that individual agency in that process is important. I'm a little more confused about exactly how to get people to start this process. Um, but at the very least, I think we should be thinking about the things we do in the system that don't interrupt it. Thanks, Sean. Christy. So, good morning. Um, just a little bit about my background to help set the context of my remarks. I have also been involved in this field for over 20 years. And I started by doing a survey out of the Urban Institute where we tracked individuals who were incarcerated in three prisons across the country, interviewed them in prison, and then followed them for a year after they were released. It was the first longitudinal multi-state study that had ever been done in the United States to actually find out what happened to the individuals who were incarcerated and were released. And this was all predicated by a question that Janet Reno, the Attorney General back in the Clinton administration, asked Jeremy Travis, the current president of Ventures, of uh, Arnold Ventures, what are we doing about all the people who are coming out of prison? At that point, there were uh, 500,000 people coming out of prison. She said, what are we doing about them? And Jeremy, Travis, and others in the room looked at her and said, we don't know. We'll get back to you on that. And so Jeremy and I left, Jeremy and I and Amy Solomon, who's now at Arnold, uh, left the Urban Institute, uh, left uh, the National Institute of Justice and went to the Urban Institute and developed this uh, survey. So two facts that I want to start my discussion of my chapter with that aren't often talked about with respect to reentry success or even people who are incarcerated, which builds on a little bit of what Sean was just saying, is that Incarcerated individuals want to change. They want to be successful citizens. They don't want to come back to prison. When we talk to them in prison, they, they're optimistic about their challenges, about, their, about their, their transition back to the community. They're hopeful that everything's going to be fine. They want to get a job, even though maybe they hadn't had a successful job, but they, wanted, they want a job. They want to be productive members of their community. They want to go back to their families. They want to raise their children. They want to have connections with their children. They want to be successful members of society. So the challenge is giving them the tools to do that. Which brings us to the next point, the next fact. They're in prison. The prison culture is not conducive to personal change. It's often a violent place. That code of the street that they, have been, that they were living in prior to incarceration morphs back into the prison. And we know this because my colleagues, and I should have uh, mentioned them at the beginning, my, my co-authors, Dan O'Connell and, and, and Hannah Cortina, have been in and out of prisons, especially Dan O'Connell, talking to individuals in focus groups and in other settings about what life is like on that cell block. And it's not conducive to personal change. There's violence. There's this macho culture. Uh, it's not conducive to empathy, to, develop, to, to be developing pro-social relationships 
among the individuals you're li you're, you are living with? How can individuals start thinking about new identities and making a new path for themselves after incarceration when they're living in this environment when they're watching their back every day? So that leads us to the third point. What's necessary for successful reentry? Well, lots of things are. But in my chapter, in our chapter, we talk about behavior change. And behavior change requires changing thinking patterns, requires some kind of identity shift. And cognitive behavioral therapy, which, which Faye talked about, is a theory of behavior change that helps individuals change those thinking patterns. It helps individuals restructure their thinking. It's an approach that's been used, for example, to stop smoking, an approach that's been used to help people come overcome their fear of flying. It's an approach that helps restructure their thinking, develop problem solving and coping skills for those situations where they may have approached that event in a different way. It's an approach that helps them regulate their emotions so if they get into a hostile or difficult situation, they have some tools for figuring out how to handle it. And it's action-oriented. It's not just sitting in a room listening to somebody talk to you. There, there's lots of role play that goes on and practice sessions so people can practice those things that they've been learning in actual interactions with their peers and with others. That's the cognitive behavioral therapy approach that could be could be and, as, and, and is being used in prison. But that brings us back to this other point when we take these three points together. We need a new environment. We need a new treatment environment because the prison culture is not conducive often to making these kinds of changes. So we need a new treatment environment, an environment that's immersive, that is restricted from the regular prison, where individuals are living under these cognitive behavioral principles day to day, where counselors, where correctional officers <coughs> are, are trained in these cognitive behavioral principles. And so that the daily tasks of living become the teaching tools. Those interactions on a day to day basis in that, in that unit where you're interacting with people, you're resolving disputes, you're interacting with your officers, those are the teaching tools to be able to take those lessons you've learned and how to restructure your thinking and deal with situations that might be difficult into play on a daily, 24-7 basis. So you think about a regular cognitive behavioral therapy. You might be in therapy 10 hours a week, taken out of your cell, go to a, go to a, to a room, and you're there 10 hours a week. Well, but there's the other 150 hours, and where are you? Those other 150 hours, you're back on that cell block. You're back in that difficult environment that makes it difficult for you to then think about personal change, think about identity shift, to, to actually practice those skills that you've been learning in those sessions. So I think one step forward, and it's, it's only a step, but one step forward to help with this identity shift may be, this hasn't been rigorous, rigorously tested, Virginia, the state of Virginia, is, is trying this out in its prisons. It hasn't been rigorously tested in Virginia. They, they claim a very, very low recidivism rate, but there's a likely selection bias, and it hasn't been well tested. This approach has been used in some jails, in, in small groups. Faith-based faith -based prisons have operated under some of these principles, but it's not very structured, you know, with manualized approaches and structured uh, training for counselors and correctional officers. But I think this is cognitive communities. I think this is a new start to, to chart a pathway for <coughs> successful reentry and potentially identity change. My idea. Terrific. It's a very good idea, and I'm going to expand on it. Um, so my, uh, my role, uh, aside from convening the panel, was uh, or to convening the working group was to try to think across the ideas uh, that uh, all of our scholars and researchers were bringing together and then to really ask some questions about the, uh, how, how would we reimagine 
uh, our approach to the reentry issue. Um, so one of my key insights was in listening to Pam talk about um, the modest results that we've gotten from our um, existing interventions. Uh, and then one thing that shows up in a couple places in her data is that we actually have some evidence that suggests that it's not just that uh, controls and uh, ex the control groups, experimental groups are equal, but sometimes the, um, the control groups do better, a little bit better, not dramatically better. They do a little bit better some, in, some, in some cases. Um, uh, and so what would, what would happen if we thought about those control groups as actually being the experiments? Um, that they, that if, if some of those people are doing better because, and it seems to be associated with us not intervening, um, what, if, what if we thought about an approach that provides support but is less, on, uh, less heavy on the intervention side? Um, another point that, that Pam makes in her paper is about, um, and she, she mentioned it on the stage too, about uh, the CBT seems to have a uh, positive effect, but the, uh, or, or areas that are focused on identity change seem to have a positive effect. The, the practical services don't seem to be associated with positive effects. In fact, they seem to be associated with negative effects. So putting those things together, um, is it, is it, I, the question I was asking myself is, in our eagerness to help, and I'm just as eager to help in this as uh, anybody else, is it possible that we're disrupting those who might be on a path to desistance? And that's really Sean's, part of Sean's insight. Um, and what happens if, if we step back a couple steps and ask, uh, ask this question of, can we create space, social programmatic space for people to assert more control over their own lives um, as a uh, as a as a premise that we would like to test, uh, uh, Stefan said in his question, uh, "We're here in this libertarian think tank." I think that would be a surprise to the people who work here. Uh, <laughs> um, but we are a market focused uh, institution. Um, uh, but I would I would want to take your your question one step further not just devolving resources to states, from the feds to the states, but how do we actually devolve resources and authority to individuals? Um, again, not as, a, uh, as a, a complete answer, but as something that needs to be tested in the, in the market of interventions that are going on in the world to see if it, um, if it, it can be um, a useful uh, useful for some people in some circumstances. So the experiment um, is designing and introducing a system that focuses on shifting identity and developing personal agency, moving from a kind of a place of learned helplessness. And Faye talked about this, you know, like prison is just the last intervention, you know, for many people who have been intervened with most of their lives, uh, school systems, juvenile justice, whatever, you know, the, We've, we tried and tried and tried to prevent this outcome. We weren't able to prevent it, so the last intervention is we're gonna separate you from society um, and, and, and keep you there for a long or a short period of time. Um, so, uh, so developing this sense of personal agency and moving from a kind of a place of learned helplessness um, because there's been so many interventions to a place of, you know, I'm the main actor in my own life. That's the, the, the identity shift that Sean was talking about. Um, and it's possible for my future to be different than my past. Those are the, so, so that's sort of the basis. So what, um, we can advance to the next slide. <clears throat> the, the, the concept um, that I've been thinking about building on um, Christie's um, uh, insights and observations about cognitive behavioral therapy and the need to establish separate units. 
um, that we would, we would experiment uh, in prisons with a process that's really a, a series of gates that test and reinforce the, the, uh, the desire for change in people who are in prison. So we use risk needs responsivity uh, frameworks to identify um, uh, people who are, we, we think, it's hard to tell looking at the outside, as, as Sean was saying, it's hard to tell, like, where are people in this continuum of desistance? But using those r and assessments to try to pinpoint or at least get a better fix on who's on this pathway. I don't think it makes sense to, uh, to bring people who, are, who have not yet reached a point where they are interested in a different life and put them in a CBT unit. I've talked to some people who have been in prisons and in CBT programs in prison, and they say, you know, until and I wasn't ready for it, uh, and it didn't make any difference for me. So we've got some work there to do to figure out who might be receptive. But then to have these units, a cognitive behavioral therapy unit um, that is built around these principles of, of cognitive change, and that it is fully bought into. Right, so it's not just the um, the the people who are in prison because they've committed crimes, but be, but the people who work with them are also fully brought into this cognitive behavioral therapy process, both because it won't work without them. You can't. It won't work without their participation, but also because I have very deep concern about what happens to correctional officers, and and the kind of persistent trauma that they're being exposed to uh, and the need to bring them into a, a more hopeful uh, environment. So uh, in the CBT pathway, there would be a contract for participation. I agree to, pers- the, I, I agree to participate fully. Uh, inmates and staff are immersed in CBT principles. Uh, I think we have to bring um, the community supervision uh, piece of this into it because there's there's more you know professionals in the system who have been exposed to repeated disappointment and trauma in the conduct of their activities, but to bring them in so they know who they're working with. We can't tell by looking at the outside who someone is, and it's not an unreasonable assumption for a probation parole officer to say look at someone and say, I've seen this story a million times. So bringing them in so they're, they're aware of that they're dealing with an a, a individual who has been through a different kind of reentry preparation. We would, of course, uh, want to see phase insights around uh, implementation intervention science applied to this. Um, uh, so there would be the CBT uh, drug abuse uh, treatment case management, all of which have some evidence behind them as having positive effects. Um, That case manager would be engaging the the individuals who are in the CBT unit in a process for uh, creating a reentry plan that's really rooted in their risk assessment. We we wanna know what the triggers are for potential uh, recidivism and have a plan that is built around those potential triggers so that people know what they're, know uh, the types of services that they might need. And, and then finally, uh, uh, and this is um, a chal- uh, what I'm about to propose is a challenge, which is the creation of some sort of services account or voucher that the individual who is leaving prison, having gone through the CBT process, has to fund the services that have been identified as part of their reentry plan. Now, it would have to have all sorts of accountability checks around it. We're not talking about handing people cash or writing them a check, but that they would be responsible for directing their own reentry based on their identified needs and the new tools, cognitive tools that they've acquired as part of the cognitive behavioral therapy process. So that's my kind of response to what I heard from all of our scholars. Now, when I presented this to our working group, I I would not say that the response was enthusiastic. Um, 
And I think there are a lot of potential challenges and problems. Uh, and I certainly don't think, I've said it at least twice and I'll say it a third time, I would not propose taking this idea and restructuring the entire criminal justice system around this idea. I don't believe that as a matter of policy development and testing. We have to have experiments. What I do think is that we are currently locked in a paradigm um, of uh, service delivery and change management with ex-offenders and uh, returning citizens um, <clears throat> that we're having a hard time pointing to whether it, uh, that it, the evidence that it has worked. And that over time, that, that failure uh, holds a threat, which is that the, the public could just say, let's go back just to incarceration. At least we got some crime reduction out of incarceration. Now we're still in a low crime, relatively speaking, in a low crime environment. We've seen some little upticks here and there. Uh, but I do think um, that we need to be cognizant that uh, the public's patience, the Congress's patience, uh, is not forever. Um, and that we need to be experimenting and showing uh, the, the people who set policy and set funding that we're serious about addressing the challenges that we've currently got uh, in terms of programs not working as well as we would like them to. So that's my kind of uh, summation of my, what I've learned out of the last two years of working with this incredibly fine group of scholars, serious-minded people, dedicated. They are working hard to try to improve the situation. This is what, I, uh, what I've learned out of them. They may regret Having given, having given me that, that opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> but um, it's, it's been a joy, really, uh, to, to be with them and to learn from them and alongside them. So um, <clears throat> now I have to put back on my moderator hat. And, um, and I wanted to, oof, dropping that book. Um, Sean, one of the... One of the questions um, that I have about your research um, is that we have this um, this number that gets thrown around all the time about you know seventy percent, sixty five, seventy percent of people who are released from prison recidivate, and you're telling us that half of uh, half of people never go back to prison. So can you help sort of? tease apart those two uh, numbers for us so that I can understand it better? Sure. So when we're talking, of, these kind of conversations are population-based conversations. The, the conversation is, okay, we have a bunch of people. Um, we then incarcerate some, and we want to know what happens. So we, we want to have a conversation about the population of people that are ever incarcerated. Um, the studies that get used for the discussion are people that have been, are the, are the well, very well done BJS studies um, from 1994, uh, 1994 and 2004, um, where they took a bunch of people that are being released from prison in a given year. That's not the same thing as the population of people that have ever been to prison. That's the population of people that are coming out of prison in a given year, which is overpopulated with people that have failed. Because the people that come out don't fail, don't show up again. And we're not talking about first-time enters, right? We're talking about everyone who's released from prison. And there's a subpopulation of people that are in prison uh, that are in prison for many times. In other words, that the pool of people that you look at if you look at releasees is overpopulated with, the, with frequent utilizers, frequent flyers, however you want to call it, uh, high-rate offenders. Uh, and that's not the population. And so if you, you can recalibrate uh, and look at the population, and the numbers are very different. Um, and the answer there is, that I think, very convincingly, um, that the majority of people who come out of prison do not return. Um, and I think you can see other, uh, I mean, we, we, we forget that if you sort of look at the trajectories of people before and after prison, the, the, the unambiguous answer is that the rates of offending afterward are lower than the rates of offending before. That's absolutely true. Now, the, what, the, unfortunately, what we're often asking is, do you have less prison, less incarcerate, less offending after if you go to prison versus if you go to probation? So there's a control group, but both groups are actually declining, and so oftentimes the answer is no difference, but they're declining, uh, both groups. 
Um, and that's, that's unambiguous. And so I think it's, a, it's a making sure you're, you're answering the question that's being asked. And in this kind of form, the question is, what's the impact of incarceration? Um, not, what's the impact of incarceration for people that have failed a bunch of times? Uh, and so I think it's, just, it's been hard, because the, the data that's, that you're working with, if you're in the program, if you're in the reentry space, are the people that are coming out of prison in a given year. And so you tend to focus on those folks. Um, but that is a, not a representative population of people that go to prison. Thank you. Uh, Christy, real quick. Um, this is something that <clears throat> comes up a lot, and you mentioned it in your comments about everybody in prison is never going back, right? You ask so them. It says they don't want to go yeah, back. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean, that yeah. they articulate this. Yeah. Well, I have learned from this. I am done. I am never going back. And yet a lot of them do. Um, so what's the, what is that? Um, uh, it, it, what's your explanation for, well, um, for that disconnect between the stated intent and what actually happens? Well, I think it comes back to the R word. Uh, the individuals who don't want to come back to prison, when they get out, they don't have the resources to make an maintain the identity shift. Let's say they have. Let's say they have this identity shift. And they're, they're ready to be a successful citizen. But they hit those obstacles, which we found out in my study, understanding challenges of people coming out of prison, and can't find a job because of the restrictions facing them in trying to find a job. Because they don't have the skills, like Sean said, many of them have never held a job, for, for, uh, a legitimate job. They don't have the skills, they don't have the education, and they, they come against these roadblocks. And they're also, and, and some of the work that a graduate student's doing with some of my returning home data that I'd never had, had a chance to, to analyze is looking at, at neighborhood effects and, per, and perceptions of neighborhoods and how going back to those neighborhoods affects individuals. And it's, and it's amazing. And those people, are, people who are coming out of prison going, are going back to those neighborhoods, and those neighborhoods are difficult places to live, and they're surrounded by drugs, by uh, antisocial peers, which is a huge risk factor for individuals. And if they cannot find a job, if they cannot make their way with this new identity shift, then the easiest way for them to make money and to get some semblance of some kind of, quote, uh, some normal life for themselves is to go back out on the street, start selling drugs, hitting up the local store to get some money. And so I think it's, I think it's the R word that, that's inhibiting individuals from being able to be successful. Uh, and we have a lot more work to do in, in, in that area. So uh, I, just to follow up on that, uh, this, the CBT is, and I think, I think this is in your essay, Pam, but you, it's necessary, right. but not sufficient. Right. And you've, you've got to have, yeah. you need both that internal change yep. as well as a, a context, a social context yep. that they're entering into that makes it possible to sustain that change. Okay. And the other thing that, that we talk a little bit about in the paper, but I didn't, I didn't talk about this morning, and needs to be, needs to be uh, fleshed out in a greater way, is that there needs to be a transition. In Delaware, we have a step-down uh, process where people are in full confinement, and they're stepped down into a, you know, a half facility. Well, there needs to be a continuation of that CBT therapeutic community in that step-down facility, too. So it just, doesn't just stop when they then go out of the, we call them level fives, into the step-down. But there's that milieu of support and, cont and cognitive behavioral principles that undergirds their life in this facility as they're making the, tra the halfway transition back into the community. And, and we have no models that have looked at that. We, may, we might have Virginia, who is doing the, uh, something like cognitive com communities, but have they trained their supervision officers in these principles? And, and have they trained their halfway facilities, if they have them in Virginia, to, to manage individuals in this process as well? And so it's a continuum. We know that these continuums of services from prisons into the community are really, really important. So this involves not just the prison, but it involves supervision officers, like some of us have talked about, 
and, and perhaps the facility in between released from full confinement you know, to the street. Terrific. I'd like to add on that. And it, I mean, I've always I'm always somewhat frustrated by the conversation about reentry because how fundamentally it's not really about reentry; it's about entry. Mm -hmm. um, and and so there's an opportunity in the um, in the prison to to have a moment, and there are evidence that suggests that there are people that take advantage of that. But it's fundamental; you know, it's not the prison doesn't cause all these problems. I'm not saying prisons are good things, but uh, the problems are often pre-existing. And what's interesting now is there's actually a moment, an opportunity going on now that I'm not even sure we're aware of. And that is that crime rates in our country are at 50-year at lows. Uh, the level of violence in the communities that now um, that were the most violent in the 19, uh, that were the least violent in the 1990s, that's the level of violence that are currently being experienced by the most violent communities we have now. Um, the level, the number of people who are involved in crime among this, these new cohorts that are now 20 years old is dramatically lower than uh, it has been for, for years. Um, if you look at the number of 18 and 19 year olds in adult prisons in 2017 relative to 2010, it's down 50%. Every, if you talk to people in prisons, you'll say the people coming in are older. Um, they're being revoked or whatever. There's sort of this group of folks that have been trapped. The, the number of people that are younger coming in is just dropping to all-time lows. So there's an opportunity because the number of people that are actually involved in crime who are, for whatever reason, entering, are fewer people are entering this life of crime. And so there's an opportunity, I think, to really uh, rethink what's going on in our communities. And so I think that focusing too much about what's going on in prison, and this is, I'm stealing something from Stefan, uh, you know, is, is I think a misplaced because really what's going on is what's going on in the community and there's a lot of things going on in the community and community corrections and the reality is the people, especially young people that are involved in this, in criminal justice is much smaller than it's ever been. So there's an opportunity here to really rethink this and help people enter so they never get to prison in the first place because the reality is the number of people coming into prison in these younger cohorts is dramatically lower, and that's going to start to be true whether we change our policies or not. Um, and I think that this is a new opportunity to really rethink about and focus on communities. And the broader conversation in sociology and criminology is really about, hey, wow, communities matter. And what's going on in communities can prevent crime and really help people enter in the first place. And I think that's a, much, um, that's a really important uh, conversation to have in this context. Uh, only focusing on the prisons, I think, is a mistake. Okay, terrific. All right, we've got time for some questions, so um, let's do that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, and just as a reminder, your name, affiliation, and uh, in the form of a question. Hi, my name is Olinda Moyd, and I'm an attorney in D.C. Um, I was really happy to hear you all talk about community supervision. Um, because most people who leave prison leave, yes, with the mindset that, that they want to be successful, but they also leave with the whole list of conditions that you have to abide by. And if you fail, then you're facing going back to prison. In D.C., the list is like 23 conditions. In Maryland, it's like 18. And so there are some jurisdictions that are moving towards just revising their conditions and shortening them um, to what really matters. So have you all looked at some of those jurisdictions that are implementing conditions that really matter and, and will support a person who wants to change as opposed to providing another obstacle for them to overcome? Either of you well, we um, I see that Jocelyn has stepped out. Arnold Ventures, one of their other big initiatives is community supervision and understanding that community supervision needs as much attention as prison reform in terms of helping with this problem. Uh, Faye Taxman is one of the nation's experts with respect to community supervision and model community supervision practices. Uh, I believe that there is a lot of uh, experimentation going on with respect to different community supervision practices, training supervision officers to interact with uh, their clients in a different way to, to motivate them. Um, 
I, have, I am not involved in doing that work, but I, I know that Faye, I mean, she's a national expert in this area. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. There aren't that many places who have actually accomplished it yet. Um, I think it's a trend we're trying to monitor and see what actually can occur. Uh, but we do know that you know that you know the more the conditions, the longer time people are on supervision. You know that actually those are uh, you know recipes for disaster. Um, so you know the two movements right now are to reduce the length of supervision. I mean there are some states where the average person is on probation supervision for five years, um, and you know it's not that unusual, um, even for some you know misdemeanor. And there are many states who are looking at this whole condition issue to see what they can do. Um, you know, so I, I, there's no evidence yet, but it, philosophically it kind of fits into what Christy was saying. The mass incarceration era led us to do all of these, pro, you know, and punishment enhancements, and now we're looking at how we can scale them back. Two points on that for me. One is that, you know, I think it's a shock to a lot of people to realize that 50% of the people that are in prison are there for revocation. I mean, I, I don't think that's fully understood. Um, and uh, the second thing is that, you know, I've done a study that shows that people that go to prison rather than probation, who are randomly assigned to prison essentially, um, are uh, more likely to end up in prison of, uh, again. But the mechanism is completely through revocations due to being on parole versus probation, where it's much easier to be revoked on probation, uh, parole versus uh, probation. Uh, and there's no evidence that they're offending at any higher rates. So this gets into this, I, I think the important issue here is recognizing that the system itself um, can actually uh, recreate create recidivism, particularly if it focuses on priors as, if, as, uh, as the trigger. Um, and so what you have is two people who are equally same, who seem to be offending at the same rate, but are being treated differently because they went through a different process. And so I think that that recognizing that the system itself, particularly one that's risk-focused to an extent to, to which priors mean, oh, you must be bad, um, therefore you can't be changing, um, might, might self-perpetuate itself in ways that I think we have to be careful about. Um, and, and revocations is certainly one of those ways. Another question. Josh. <clears throat> Josh Good with uh, Ethics and Public Policy Center. And I have a question rooted in the cover uh, a little bit. Um, I remember a cover of a similar um, report that sort of had an individual leaving on his own and you, the, some of the associations with that. And I've been reading a little bit from Naomi Schaefer Riley uh, here at AEI about uh, the role that, that various communities are playing in coming alongside the foster care system and particularly a lot of churches, a lot of evangelical churches. I'm curious uh, as to how you see the role of religious congregations in the country, if there are 370 or so thousand, 370,000 congregations in the country, uh, are you more positive or less positive on them after 18 years of work in this space? And, and what role could they play uh, in return? So I'm, I, I'm mixed on it. Uh, I, I, uh, I know that religious congregations in this country have, uh, they, they form a very intense base of interest in this issue. They really care um, about uh, about reentry. Um, you know the the biblical mandates around caring for the and visiting the prisoner, caring for the prisoner, uh, have it has a deep, deep resonance uh, in the African American community. Of course, it's even more intense because that's actually a significant part of um, many of the, the lives of those congregations. So the passion is there, the desire is there. I sometimes wonder whether that is in any way matched with the kind of knowledge and understanding that's required to be effective in this space. And I say that as a person who ran the Center for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives. So it's, you know, I have enormous respect for faith institutions um, in this, but I, I, uh, I think that sort of, um, th there has to be more than just passion 
um, for this if they're going to be more effective than they have been. Let's see, we've got a question in the back. Thank you. Um, Heather Rice Minus from Prison Fellowship. Um, and Who is one of the people you will find on the back of this book. So, so. <laughs> um, Question on um, selection bias. I'm curious if you are finding, particularly you know, in the context of faith-based programming like ours, um, where there are obviously constitutional issues to um, admitting people to the program and making sure it is voluntary. And so wondering if you're seeing any kind of promising practices in um, controlling for selection bias in program design. I mean, the first thing is I, I have a different take on selection bias than a lot of people, so I, based on what I've been talking about, right? I like selection bias. I mean, I think we know people who are participating in programs do better than those who don't. That's because there are people that are successful, and the, one of the paths of success is going through programs. Um, so um, the, the question, of course, is whether or not the program itself um, uh, is causally associated, given the expense or whatever, uh, with that. And so the, the problem, of course, is that you need to start with, it. If, if it is, in fact, um, uh, relevant that you be ready, then you need to start with a group of people that are ready. Well, if you then take a group of motivated people uh, and allow some to have the program and some not, you know, what we found in some other work is that the motivated people, like for example, the people that can generate an appeal for uh, getting rejected as part of, uh, you know, in a job application, those people that can generate a, an appeal, even after they get rejected, they do just fine, right? Because you tell them no, unless there's just simply no other opportunities, they go somewhere else. Um, so the, the problem, of course, is working with motivated people is they're motivated. So there's this sort of, and, and now we're back to how do we get people to be motivated in the first place. Um, so I, uh, I, I think that, um, but, but the evidence, you know, of course, we get into this, this couple of problems with creaming. If you start talking about this way, this is something that Pam has talked about. But if you look at people that are ready for programs, some of her work was very influential in this. They, they, there seems to be, even after you do random assignment, some effect. And so I, I do think there's this little bit of a tension with respect to identifying a group of people that are ready for the program as opposed to just offering it to everyone. Um, because you know, the, the problem here is if you just offer it to everyone and only a third of the people are motivated, now you've got to have an effect three times as big as the, the normal effect to find anything. So there is a need to, 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 to do this readiness piece. Um, and, um, but, and I think that that's, that that's just a fact. And trying to figure out the way through this is a little bit hard. Um, I still think that there's value in the signal itself. The fact that your program, I think your program has been shown to be moderately effective in a, in a, in a randomized control trial or ways with reasonable control, but the fact that you're producing people that have very low recidivism rates after they exit the program is relevant that can then be used by the next step. So provided your program doesn't cost $10 million per person, which it doesn't, why is this not relevant? Right? Because we've identified people some of whom look quite risky, who seem to be taking the positive steps, who, if supported, can continue along that path. I think it's relevant. OK, I like that. Yes, yes ma'am, over here. Hi, my name is Talisa Carter. I'm an assistant professor at American University, and I used to be a corrections officer. So I have a CEO question. Um, so for most of what everybody said today is about kind of innovations around um, and buy-in from correctional officers and frontline staff to make these things happen. But I'm curious as to what I'm assuming would be an identity change for the profession or CBT um, training um, in training for CEOs. I'm wondering what that looks like considering the profession remains predominantly white, predominantly male, attrition rate is crazy, um, the fact that also, the people that are drawn to the profession usually are former military, um, have military experience, or they use the job as a stepping stone to become police officers. So I'm wondering what identity shift at the occupational level looks like for you guys. Great question. So, <laughs> Talisa used to be one of my students. Um, so in the challenges section and limitations section of the chapter, if you've read it, uh, the top one is changing the correctional culture. And this is something that I do not know a lot about. 
Um, I do know that in, a, in another program that the, that the University of Delaware um, did, it was a probation uh, um, supervision program, we selected officers who wanted to be part of a different approach for uh, helping individuals who are on sub supervision uh, take a different path. Um, so some people could argue, well, you know, you're selecting officers. Uh, but again, as, as Sean said, that's at least you know, one step, is to select officers that will be willing to try a new approach and then, and then go from there. Um, so I, again, Faith has a lot more experience in this area than I do. But I think that we have to start with a, a groups of correctional officers. And there are out there that uh, I'm sure you were one of them when you were down in Georgia that want to make a difference, that want to help individuals that are incarcerated. Um, but the culture uh, uh, is difficult for officers. And this is the kind of thing that's happening in Norway, uh, where, uh, which was mentioned previously, where officers are recruited in a different way and trained in a different way to interact with individuals who are incarcerated in a different way. Um, there's a lot of conversation about bringing that kind of model to the United States. Several states are engaged in that. Groups of officers have gone over to Norway to spend time um, uh, sort of shadowing officers in the, the Norway facilities to see what's going on. Uh, this is the kind of thing that requires a major organizational shift, the kind of thing that Faye was talking about, uh, institutional uh, leadership to say, OK, this is the way we're going to do things. This is the way we're going to do things differently. I think it could happen on a smaller basis by starting with like a cognitive community, where you start with a small group of officers in a, in a, in a separate unit um, to see whether or not, to, to work out the kinks, to see how this is, 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 can, can work in practice. So I, I just wanted to add on to that for a second. Um, I, I, I've been looking at the Norway, yeah. you know, the experiment that um, is going on. In, it's Pennsylvania, right? Uh, Pennsylvania is starting, yes. Yeah. And um, what was interesting in listening to some of the researchers who are working on it is that, you know, we always hold up the Scandinavian nations as being, you know, models in social welfare broadly and including this area. And uh, because of their refugee crisis, uh, the prison populations are shifting. They're no longer um, monolithically Danish or Swedish or Norwegian, and they're actually now starting to talk with some of our experts about what does it mean to manage a diverse prison population. Um, so uh, this is uh, it's a it's a fascinating experiment. It's something I hope that we get a chance to look at very closely um, and, and what's going on at Drexel. Um, we've got time for one more question, and I think I'm going to choose you right here. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm Marlene Beckman, formerly with OJP and now focusing on being a vo volunteer. And my question kind of builds on what you were just discussing. Uh, and Brent, I wanted to address my question to you and whether or not you've thought about the model you proposed at the beginning of somebody's criminal career rather than after they've come out of prison. The issue about uh, the cor correctional officer and who they would be in their training would be more social workers, a different kind of person that would uh, be doing the interaction. And how would that be if we, we started this process of letting people have vouchers for improving their lives and mm -hmm. getting out of a criminal career earlier in the right. system rather than later? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. I, one of my heroes in, in that kind of area of like rewarding success rather than punishing failure, you know, the, the kind of investing up front is a, a guy by the name of Mauricio Miller. He's written a book called The Alternative, and he's an, an old hand in social welfare policy. And he points precisely to this problem that all of our all of our social programming, including reentry, is focused on people who have um, who have not done the right things, actually, and we're trying now trying to pull them out, and instead shifting some of that investment to helping communities and individuals within those communities grow and th and thrive 
and uh, he talks about you know being in uh, leading programs funded by the federal government, where uh, young people would come in looking for assistance and job training, and it was like I can't help you because you're not risky enough, you know you're not you don't have enough problems, so I can't I can't help you, and it's it, that that's a perverse thing that we need to like address and think about, and I think he's done a good job um, with it. So uh, we, need to keep, we need to keep thinking about it and trying to, you know, what would an experiment like that look like uh, in the context of crime reduction? Um, I'm interested in considering it. So thank you all uh, very, very much for your uh, long-suffering patience with a long program. And I want to thank our, our scholars, uh, our working group scholars, um, both those who are present with us today and, and those who aren't. Um, they're doing amazing work, and I'm really grateful for all of you uh, in helping to guide, um, uh, guide us to a more hopeful future. Stay tuned. This is just the beginning of uh, my efforts around this topic area, and I look forward to seeing you all again in the future.